you get there, say amen. Well, I can just have two guys. Amen. Not yet. Okay. Oh, okay. Instead of saying amen, maybe I should say oh my. <laughs> That's why somebody's got some people got them Bibles with the little labels on them. <laughs> well, while you're getting there, we need to start off by saying this. Over the years, I've, I've preached several times on the book of Jonah. And I've always emphasized how he was running from God. How he had a rebellious attitude towards God. That he was out of touch with God, so out of touch that he was sound asleep during a storm that nearly sank their ship. That he wanted them to throw him overboard because he wanted to end his life. And that is basically the story of Jonah. And to tell it like that would be to tell it right, because that's what happened. But this past week, something happened that opened up my eyes concerning Jonah's situation. I feel like my understanding of what he went through and what he was dealing with kind of gave me a, a fresh perspective on his situation. A new way of looking at Jonah. The last few weeks, we've all been following the news reports concerning what's going on in Iraq and Syria with this terrorist group, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They've been executing everyone that doesn't pledge allegiance to Allah, leaving their bullet-riddled bodies in mass graves. They've been burying people alive, beheading children. Others have been crucified. Countless more are being beheaded. This past week, our nation looked on in horror and outrage when the same terrorist group executed American journalist James Foley by cutting off his head. And if their terrorist demands are not met, and they won't be because the United States says they don't, they don't negotiate with terrorists. So they've threatened to execute another hostage. They already showed this guy. They said James Foley volunteered to be the first one to buy this other guy some time. They're asking a million dollar ransom. They said, we don't pay ransom, so uh, unless something drastically changed, turns out that they try to get a rescue squad in there to get this guy out of there, but they, they, they keep moving, changing their location, so it's hard to track down where they're at. Having said that, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been so angry about what's going on that I found my anger turn into hatred, and it felt good to hate them. Because my flesh said they deserve to be hated. Because they're nothing but animals, barbaric, bloodthirsty animals. That's what I was telling myself. When I saw the photos of this man being beheaded, I said, what animals? Humans don't act that way. And I found myself thinking that we should just drop a nuclear bomb over the Middle East and take out Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and every other terrorist group and then let God sort them out. That's what I was saying out loud to myself. Saying stuff like, you know what? We ought to level that place and turn it into a parking lot. Iraq, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, just turn it into one large parking lot. That's what I was thinking. And then for some reason I started thinking about the prophet Jonah. I know it was God. Because in the middle of my ranting about this, I started thinking about Jonah. I said, wow, where'd that come from? Well, it came from God. And it was like God began speaking my heart concerning the hatred and prejudice. I'm going to be honest. I wrestle with prejudice just like everybody else. Hatred that's been building up since 9-11. Just boiling, getting worse with each passing day. The thought crossed my mind that Jonah must have felt the same way when God called him to go to Nineveh. And with that thought in mind, I want to preach today on the subject. Seeing life through the eyes of Jonah. Notice, first of all, God's burden for a wicked nation. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Here in this passage of Scripture, we see God's burden 
for the city of Nineveh, and he tells Jonah to go to that wicked city and cry out against it, warn it concerning God's coming judgment. What do we know about Nineveh? And why was it considered such a wicked city? Did some research. The Assyrians who inhabited the city of Nineveh were considered some of the most warlike people that were known throughout the land for their cruelty and their barbaric nature. Sound familiar? Sounds like what we're dealing with today. They were warlike. They lived for war. And they didn't just defeat their enemies. They were cruel and barbaric. Those who were taken prisoners were often skinned alive or beheaded. And then their heads were placed on spikes or spears outside the captured city walls as a warning to others. Others had their hands, feet, and tongues cut out. Many had their eyes put out. Parents were often forced to watch their children being burned alive just before the parents themselves were killed. The Ninevites were also known to bury their victims up to their necks in the sand and then leave them to die of thirst and hunger. Those who were taken prisoner that were brought back to their home city would be stripped of all dignity. No shoes, walking across that hot sand, no shoes, no clothing. They would place a thick fish hook attached to a long rope. The fish hook would be either placed through their lips, through their nostril, through their eyelid, or some other body part, and they were dragged from the city in this condition. Those that didn't keep up would literally have their flesh pulled from their bodies where that fish hook was attached. I mean, that's insane. <clears throat> History reports that whole cities have been known to commit mass suicide rather than fall into the hands of the Ninevites. They would rather kill themselves than deal with the Ninevites. So that's who they were. When I read something like that, all I can think of, some things never change. They were no different than the terrorists that we're seeing today. Same thing, same situation, same kind of attitude, same kind of cruelty. But here's the thing. God has a burden for all mankind. He had a burden for those Ninevites, which is why he wanted Jonah to go there. I find it hard to believe. But that's why God wanted Jonah to go to the Ninevites, because he had a burden for them. And though it's hard for us to comprehend God also has a burden for every one of those terrorist groups. My flesh says, no way, uh-uh. But it's the same tribe, same type of people, same type of attitude, same type of barbaric attitude. Notice what we're told in 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Put another way, God doesn't want to see anyone end up in hell. It's His desire that all people would get saved. Not all do, but it's God's heartfelt desire that all would come to repentance. That's what it says there. Now here's the thing. We look at ourselves and we say, well, you know, I've got my faults. <coughs> I've got some sinful habits, but good night. I'm a lot better than the Muslims that are cutting people's heads off. We're comparing ourselves to other people. So we think we stack up pretty good. I've never buried anyone alive. I've never skinned anyone alive. I've got my faults, but I'm not that bad. In our minds, there are degrees of wickedness, levels of evil, if you will. We think of someone like Osama bin Laden or Hitler and say, well, they're the wicked of the wicked. And maybe in one sense they are. They've done some depraved things. And we see ourselves as having white collar sins, if you will. Sins, but nothing of a bad degree. We don't think we're too bad, but the problem is that we're comparing ourselves to one another. So we all stack up pretty good. I know I'm not a saint, but I'm not like this guy over here. I'm not like that crowd over there. And that's where the problem comes in. We're comparing ourselves to one another. But the Bible states in Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
There's the key. We might stack up pretty good when we compare ourselves to one another. But when we compare ourselves to God's standard of righteousness, the Bible says all come short of the glory of God. We all fall short. Some more, some less. But we all fall short. Which is why God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for us. Yes. Because none of us were good enough in ourselves to get to heaven. Now the reason why I said all that is the fact that sin is sin in the eyes of God. It's all wicked. And whether you're a terrorist or a good, honest, moral, religious person that happens to be lost, whatever sin is keeping you from knowing God, that sin is enough to doom your hell, your, your soul to an eternity in hell. Think about that for a second. Osama bin Laden, if he didn't repent, he's in hell right now. And someone who's religious but lost is going to be right next to him. Probably won't see him. Probably won't have much conversation for him because they're going to be tormented. But hell is going to be full of a lot of religious people. A lot of good people that just don't know Jesus as their Savior. And that's a tragedy. Listen, until we start seeing people through the eyes of God, we'll never have a burden for souls and we'll never overcome our anger, our hatred, and our prejudice. And we'll never be able to take our Christian walk to the next level, which is found in Matthew 5.44. But I say unto you, Jesus speaking, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I gotta be honest with you. There's a whole lot of days where I'm not praying for my enemies, or if I am, I'm praying that God would strike them down, that God would vaporize them. You got a supervisor at work that's giving you a hard time. We're told to pray for them, and that's not talking about praying that God would send a lightning bolt and vaporize them. <laughs> Until we start doing that, we're seeing life through the eyes of Jonah, and we're no different in our attitude. Than Jonah was. Which brings us to the next point. Having looked at God's burden for a wicked nation, notice secondly, Jonah's rebellion against God. Jonah 1 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was a prophet of God. He had been used by God before and God was fixing to use him again. But when Jonah is told that he is to go to Nineveh, he hightails it out of there as fast as he can. Gets on a ship going in the complete opposite direction of where God wanted him to be. If you look at a map, he was supposed to go to Nineveh. He went to Tarsus, which is the complete farthest point away from where God wanted him to be. The question before us is why? Why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? I'll give you several possibilities as to why he didn't want to go there. Number one, maybe he thought it was a waste of time because he didn't think they would listen. This is something that I struggle with all the time. God might start tugging on my heart about someone and in my mind I'm saying, it's a waste of time. They're not going to listen. They got no interest. How do you know what's going on in their heart? what they're dealing with in their life. But that's our logic. Oh, no, 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 no way, Lord. Please, don't waste what little time I've already got. What happens is you'll come across some folks that are in bad shape, just a mess in their lives. And God starts speaking to our hearts to help them in some way, whether it's to invite them out to church, whether it's a kind word, whether it's to pray for them, whether it's to take an interest in their lives. And all we can think is, it's a waste of time. They're a lost cause. They're unsalvageable. They're too far gone for anyone to help them. Why bother, Lord? Then God begins to shed His light on our souls. And He shows us how hard our heart has become. How calloused and cold we've become. And then God steps back to see what we're going to do. Just like, here's this flashlight on our soul. And then He steps back. He's not going to force His will on us. But he's going to wait and see what we're going to do. Are you willing to soften your heart and reach out to that person with the love of God? Or are you going to turn away just like Jonah did? Just like on that 
road where that Samaritan was hurt, and the priest and the Levite and the other fellow passed by as far on the other side of the road. I don't got time. I don't, I don't want to get involved. He leaves it up to us. But I will say this. We pray and ask to be used by God. But there's no telling how many missed opportunities have happened in our lives because we didn't feel like it was worthwhile. We didn't feel like we had enough time. We didn't feel like it would be worth the effort. No telling how many chance opportunities have gone by the wayside because God said, well, here it is. And we walked away from it. Here's the thing. Number one, we can't give up on people because God didn't give up on us. That thought stopped me dead in my tracks. I was in just as bad a shape as some of these people that are out there that I shake my head at today. Just as bad a shape as they were. If someone hadn't taken an interest in my life, started praying for me, reaching out to me, inviting me out to church, I wouldn't be here today. Neither would you. Someone touched our lives in some way. Someone prayed for us. Someone shared the gospel with us. Someone gave us a track. Someone invited us, invited us out to church. Can we do any less? We may look at someone whose life is a mess and think that they're hopeless, but God does His greatest work in impossible situations and with hopeless causes. Because then He gets the greatest glory. I've seen some of these children homes, and the kids get up there and sing a couple songs, and these kids, they just look so sweet. They're dressed nice. They talk nice. They're just wonderful children. And then they start sharing their testimony, where they were a year, where they were two years ago, where they were five years ago. And you're going, that's impossible. To see these kids living for God, and tears of joy for God, and to hear them tell where they used to be, it's hard to fathom. But many can share that same story. God doesn't give up on people, and neither should we. Number two, there's a second possible reason why Jonah fled from God. Simply because he had no desire to go to Nineveh. It's that simple. Again, I can relate to that because there are places that I got no interest of going to. Camden, Newark, Trenton, East Orange. I don't care if a group's there singing. I don't care if they're giving away free food there. I just got no desire to go through it. And if I'm passing through them towns, I got my windows up, I got my doors locked, and I ain't slowing down for nothing. Right. Even Mount Holly's getting dangerous. Mm -hmm. Man, the other day, 6.30 in the morning, someone was knocking at my door wanting to use my phone, mm -hmm. came in my yard with a pit bull, got arrested, left his pit bull there in my yard. <laughs> it's a miracle my dog Muggsy wasn't, wasn't dog food that morning. Now I'm all paranoid, checking doors, checking windows, the alarm on. It kind of rattled me. I told you about six months ago, my car got stolen, my bike got stolen, my radio got stolen. And all I can think of is this, I gotta get out of Mount Holly. I gotta get out of here. Get out of that neighborhood, right. Turn over to Lamentations. I want to show you something here. I preached this last Sunday night, but it, it bears repeating. After the book of Jeremiah, Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 4. you got to see this. There's only a handful of people here, so it, you, know, you might be hearing it for the first time. I mean, that's real spiritual, isn't it? I want to move out of Mount Holly to some place in the woods. <laughs> Lamentations chapter 4. I think you're going to find this interesting. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 18. I preached a message Sunday night on beware of the pursuers. One of the ways the enemy attacks us, he pursues us. Verse 18. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. For our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. Wow. This passage of scripture perfectly describes what we're dealing with 
and what we're up against. Notice what we're told. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near, our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. That's talking about being afraid to walk your streets at night. Being afraid of strangers, not trusting people. Watching the devil slowly take over our town and take control of our streets. There's folks that have written off Mount Holly. The end is near. It's going under. For the record, moving away isn't the answer. Because it's bad everywhere. We were talking earlier. They're having the same problem in Mount Laurel, Morristown, Cherry Hill. <coughs> there ain't nowhere you can move where there's not going to be crime or, or serial killers or, or wackos. Two young girls got kidnapped up in Amish country. They were at their farm stand. Two people passing by saw these young girls and kidnapped them. Up in Dutch, Dutch land, Lancaster, one of the nicest areas, one of the most godly areas you'll ever see. God help us. There's nowhere you can go where darkness isn't trying to take over. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because it was a bad place. He probably wouldn't have wanted to go to Canaan or Trenton or maybe Mount Holly either. But I can tell you this. There's no safer place to be than in the perfect will of God. Yeah. I'm talking about being where God wants you to be and doing what He's called you to do. There ain't no so safer place to be than doing the will of God. Wherever it is He calls you to do it. Jonah had nothing to worry about if he would have obeyed God. It was when Jonah ran from God and got away from God that his troubles began. Lamentations 418 states it was over. The end was near. At least that's what the people thought. That's what they had convinced themselves to believe. That's what a lot of folks are thinking about some of the cities. It's what they're thinking about America. Oh, we're done. We're finished. We're finished as a great nation. There'll never be revival again. It's too late. Don't start listening to the devil's lies. Because you know what? God is still in control. <laughs> And when, as long as God is in control, He can turn any situation around for His glory. And it ain't over until God says it's over. Amen? Amen. And that ain't going to happen until the rapture takes place. So until that happens, no tell them what God might do in Philadelphia, in Trenton, in Newark. We're seeing reports of churches that have the same burden that are marching around the outskirts of the city, praying over that city that God would do something supernatural. The point is this. There are folks that have given up on Mount Holly. They've given up all hope that this church, or any church for that matter, can make a difference. Church age is over, they tell you. They're con they've convinced themselves that Mount Holly, or Camden, or Newark, or Trenton, are just too far gone for anything to change. Thank God for a remnant of His people that still believe in the power of prayer, that still believe that all things are possible with God, that still believe there's hope for America to rise up from the ashes, and that still believes that the church can make a difference. The answer is not to run from God as Jonah did. The solution is to take back this town street by street. Take back soul by soul those that the devil has taken captive through sin. It's not an overnight thing, but it's one at a time, one soul at a time, one street at a time. I mentioned Wednesday night that there's this place in Chicago. This real estate was so bad, they were literally giving it away. Wow. Pacific Gardens Missions yeah. bought a dilapidated building there because it was such a dangerous area. It was a, the Bowery. Derelicts were just flopped in the doorways and hung over cars. They started winning souls, street by street, individual by individual. The real estate is now some of the most valuable real estate in Chicago. Everybody wants it now because they've cleaned up the area, bought all the dilapidated buildings, and they got a food kitchen, and they got a, a service center, and they got all these other things because no one wanted those places until they went in there and cleaned the town up by just winning everybody to Jesus. Amen! Amen. Lord! Right. Through the power of prayer, and through the power of God's word, we can set free those that are in bondage to sin. We can win these streets back for the glory of God. Start praying. Write down all the street signs in this area. Start praying. And then put feet to your prayer. 
will start knocking on doors, inviting people out. Leave the results with God. In our minds, this fellow might look like he's too far gone, but you don't know what God can do. And there's a third reason why Jonah may have run from God. Maybe he thought he'd be killed. Thought his life was in danger if he went to Nineveh. Earlier, I shared with you what the Assyrians were capable of. And maybe Jonah was terrified by the prospect of facing that kind of death. I wouldn't be too crazy about being skinned alive, being buried alive, having my head cut off. So maybe those things were crossing his mind. They were barbaric. He probably figured, man, I'm no sooner going to set foot in that city and I'm a dead man. But I will tell you this, how God works everything out for his glory. Jonah spent three days and three nights in that whale's belly. And if you know anything about the digestive system, you've got acidic juices that break down food particles to help it easier to pass through your system. Scientists believe that when Jonah was spit out of that whale, he was completely white, like an albino. All his hair on his head, his eyebrows, the eyelashes, it was completely removed from the acid of that whale. Three days working on it. So when he came up out of that water, scared them Assyrians to death. They didn't know what to make of it. See Jonah come up out of the water. Where'd you just come from? Belly of a whale. You want to talk about people that were so shook up that they were willing to move. We better listen to what this guy has to say. He must have looked like an alien or something like that. So God used that for, for his glory also. But as mentioned earlier, there's no safer place to be than where God wants you to be. Nothing will happen to us as long as we have that hedge of protection around us. But here's the thing. Going to Nineveh may have seemed like a dangerous thing to do, but it's much more dangerous to be out of the will of God. It's much more dangerous to drift from God and find your life going in the wrong direction. That's much more dangerous. Let me just add this. You can run, but you can't hide from God. He will only let you drift so far and for so long before He said, that's it, enough's enough. Jonah went in the complete opposite direction. Thought he put some distance between him and God. God was right there. You probably won't get swallowed by a great fish, but you may find yourself going through some storms until you get right with God and get heading back in the right direction. So it's something to think about. One last reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, I believe he hated those people. I have to believe that was the main reason why Jonah rebelled against God. The Assyrians were hated by everyone, especially the Jews. And for Jonah to go to Nineveh would be like you or me going to Iraq to bring the gospel to those terrorists. Even the thought of it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. In our flesh we say, no way. They're animals. They don't deserve to be saved. They don't deserve to live. I've said it. I say it with shame, but I've said it. But that's probably what Jonah was thinking. Because when the people of Nineveh repented of their sin and God sent revival, rather than be happy that God had spared the city and that countless souls were saved, rather than rejoice in that, Jonah was ticked off. He was actually mad at God for sparing the city. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Let's take a look at it. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah 4, 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Didn't I tell you, Lord, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before you unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So there it is. Jonah knew of the love of God, which is why he didn't want to go there, because he knew that God's love could overcome anything. The love of God will overcome a multitude of sins. And then people were involved in a multitude of sins, and Jonah knew that. So basically, he's telling God right here, you see that? Now that's why I didn't want to go there, because I knew you were going to pour your love out on these people. That's why I didn't want to go there. Verse 3. 
Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Is that a legitimate reason to be angry? Because I saved a bunch of people? Because I sent revival? Because I reached this wicked nation and they repented? Is that a reason to be angry and want to die? The only possible explanation for Jonah's attitude was hatred and prejudice. Hating them so bad that he was hoping God would just vaporize the whole place. As I said earlier, turn it into a parking lot. Listen, there's something bad wrong with our hearts when we can care less whether someone lives or dies. I was actually glad when Osama bin Laden died, when uh, Saddam Hussein died. I was actually glad about it. Maybe even said the words good, good written, something like that. I'm just being honest. There's something bad and wrong when we realize, we know, the, we know the mechanics of the Bible, that if someone dies lost, if someone dies from execution or some other means, and they haven't received Christ as their Savior, we know that according to the Scripture, their bodies may go on the ground, but their soul is immediately sent to hell for all eternity. And I'm ashamed to say that <clears throat> I've had far too many moments like that where in my heart I was just saying good riddance to bad rubbish. One less knucklehead to worry about. Many, many, I'm not the only one that feels that way. I see things in the news and my flesh just rises up and the Holy Spirit's like in a tug of war because I know what the right thing is. I know what the Bible says and so did Jonah. This flesh loves to hate. This flesh loves to be prejudiced. This flesh don't have any love. So how do we overcome that kind of attitude? These things that we wrestle with. How do we stop seeing light through the eyes of Jonah and start seeing people through the eyes of God? Number one, you've got to ask God to soften your heart. Spending time in prayer, spending time in the Word will keep your heart tender. So it starts there. The Word of God is like a tenderizer. You start spending time in the Bible, keeps your heart tender. You start praying. I mean, your prayer might be something like this, Oh Lord, somebody needs to go help those people. And then God be laying in your heart to be that somebody. Ask God to soften your heart. Because you know what? If you watch enough news, you read enough papers, your heart can get cows where you can sit there eating your cocoa puffs and not even blink an eye when you read about stuff that's going on in the world. When we get to that point, we're in bad shape. Number two, never lose sight of your own spiritual condition. This is what sometimes happens. We get saved. We're saved for several years. God cleans us up. God starts using us, and we forget where we came from. But for the grace of God, I can be on my help one way to on a, to hell right now as we speak. But for the grace of God. But he lifted me up out of the muck and mire of sin and set my feet upon the rock, which is Jesus. Amen. Don't ever lose sight of where you were. We were no different than the prodigal son. <clears throat> Fight the pigs for the corn husks. But for the grace of God. I don't think about the past a lot. But when I need to be humble, I think about where I used to be and what I was doing, and, and it puts everything in perspective. <clears throat> put it put another way, never forget where you come from or who you used to be. Number three, ask God to help you to see the good in people. My wife's really helped me about this because she'll mention somebody and I'll just kind of roll my eyes. And she says, you know what? You gotta start seeing people the way God does. God was able to look beyond our fault and our sin to see the person that we had the potential to be. We need to do the same thing. <clears throat> sure, their lives might be a mess. Sure, they might be in bad shape. But we've got to look beyond that. Because that's how God sees us. Everyone's got good qualities. They might be buried under layers of decay, layers of sin, but everyone's got some good in it. we just got to Help them to get that muck and mire off them to get back to where they need to be. Number four, be sensitive to the Lord's leading. Cities and streets are one 
one soul at a time. If God speaks to your heart to reach out to someone, the best thing you can do is just mind God. Just do what He tells you to do, whatever it may be. And that's how you stay out of trouble. We may not like the direction God is pointing us. We may not understand what God is trying to do. But we just got to trust God because He knows what He's doing. And then lastly, number five, get a burden for souls. Sometimes when I'm in New York City and I see this mass of people or in Philadelphia or some other area, all I can think is, my Lord, how many of these people are saved? Probably not a whole lot. And it kind of puts things in perspective. Sometimes I'll watch these documentaries on volcanoes and lava. Lava, which is really what a lake of fire is going to be, liquid fire. When I worked security at this uh, pipe, pipe fitting place, they had these giant burn ups, these giant fires that melt the metal. And I'd get as close as I could and kind of put my hand near the flame just to get a perspective in my mind. It smelled like brimstone and it felt like hell. And I used to say, Lord, don't let me ever forget this feeling, this smell. Because there's people that I know that are heading to this place of torment. When I picture in my mind the torment that is hell, I wouldn't wish my worst enemies there, let alone people that I love, people that I care about. Here's the thing. If we don't reach out to people that God brings across our path, they may not get reached. And there are many souls that may end up in hell. We can make a difference. We can have an impact. We start seeing life through the eyes of God. Why don't we all stand?